we all are work for you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ivy. Are we on here? We're on now, I think. Okay, thank you, Ivy, and thank you very much to the organizers um, for the invitation to the Convention of uh, Biological Diversity, to CABI, to FAO, to IOBC. Thank you all. It's an honor to be here on behalf of the industry. So just a little brief insight into the International Biocontrol Manufacturers Association. We call it IBMA because it's a bit easier to say we have 211 members across 37 countries, from global multis to uh, SMEs, and the majority of our membership are in fact SMEs. Um, we are global, but with a European focus, 65% of our members are in Europe. We have national groups um, in Europe, but also in Africa. And we work with other uh, biocontrol associations around the world. And um, as part of that, indeed, we've been working with Ivy and some of her colleagues in, a, um, in the farm project, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. So someone talked about definitions earlier on, uh, and I, I should just share the definition that I'm referring to from biocontrol perspective. And that's both the invertebrates um, and the microbials, which are, uh, if you like, the living, uh, the living uh, biocontrol. And then we have the other types of biocontrol, the semiochemicals, chemicals and uh, the natural substances, which may be plant extracts or maybe proteins or maybe animal extracts, um, but naturally based, nature-based um, solutions. Now, Raghu mentioned very eloquently <laughs> all the areas that biocontrol contributes to in terms of uh, the UN policies and uh, broader policies. Uh, but I think at a very high level, one can say that biodiversity and climate are two of the critical things um, that we're facing. And biocontrol does huge benefits in both of those areas. So at a very basic level, we see all these policies happening in every country around the world when we have a lot of the solutions, all the people sitting in this room um, and uh, and we need to be able to get out there and, and, and share them. Uh, there was um, some discussion this morning about measurement, measurement of uh, biodiversity and the importance of that. Um, and there are not so many really good uh, studies on that that, uh, that we're aware of, uh, but a very nice one in Albufera in Spain, um, which has been going for many, many years, but they switched to uh, mating disruption from um, just standard uh, OP pesticides at the time. But they saw a tenfold increase in the aquatic birds uh, nesting and were able to, to measure this. So there was an immediate, uh, okay, over a period of years, but we've seen a sustained increase and in enhancement in biodiversity. When we look at uh, climate change, greenhouse gas um, emissions, then interesting, McKinsey reported last year um, that the second most important action you can do on farm is to switch to biologicals. And biologicals in the broadest sense, so biostimulants, biocontrol, just make it biological. So I was gonna to touch on market um, and then talk a little bit about some of the two key areas of challenges, but also a few of the successes and maybe some of the best practices that we can um, cover and uh, demonstrate and uh, call out, shout out um, so we can share them and, and copy them and take them further. So the market. There is really a recognition of biocontrol and it's becoming increasingly important and an increasingly important market. So eight billion US dollars, this is done on trimmer information in 2023, but expected to grow by 2029 to about 15 uh, billion. So that's a doubling, that's a doubling in, uh, in six years. What we also had a look at um, through our industry survey, so thank you to the members who, uh, who allowed us to complete this, is looking at the different types of biocontrol. So you see here the total market, so the European market of about 1.6 uh, billion. Um, then when you turn and look at the four different categories that I showed at the beginning, so you have the microbials, the semia chemicals, the natural substances, and the invertebrates. Then if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you see the invertebrates. Now, interestingly, you see roughly a doubling between 2019 and 2022. 
um, and you see a roughly, uh, well, a sort of pretty steady increase, maybe slowing increase um, in the last three years in the other three areas. And part of the reason for that is it takes an awfully long time, five to 10 years to get your PPP, your plant protection product, of which microbials, natural substances, and senior chemicals are all classified as in Europe, it takes a long time to get them onto the market. So in fact, that is actually uh, slowing, slowing the growth. But the great news is, is that for invertebrates, they're sitting in a different system, um, as uh, Nick and Rob referred to earlier on. Um, so there we see um, continued growth. So how do we actually meet the need for, for more biocontrol? We're seeing um, a need for it. We're seeing the market growing. What do we need to do? Well, there are really two key areas as uh, we see it. One is regulation that's fit for purpose wherever you are and knowledge transfer. So making sure that people understand how to use it, what it is, and that it actually works. So although there's this um, global recognition on the need, then as I said, there are, these, there are these two areas, and they can roughly be broken down into harmonization, and sometimes there being a lack of harmonization, that sometimes we have pathways that are maybe not really fit for purpose. They're not really fit for biocontrol. They might be great for chemistry, but they're maybe not so great for biocontrol. And they can be too slow. Not everywhere, but they can be too slow. And that's not just for industry, it's also for farmers. Because actually, there is a huge need out there now. So we need to be able to get these products fully evaluated to farmers quickly. And then when one thinks about knowledge transfer, it's actually sharing and working with the farmer to implement this as needed. So looking a bit at regulation. We talked about harmonization. And um, I know Paul is going to be talking tomorrow. Um, so uh, I don't want to steal his show, but they've done a great job um, in East Africa uh, with Ivy and with, with others and Cabby um, of pulling together really a harmonized uh, regulation that's actually fit for purpose. It's about bio logicals, it's about biocontrol, and that's really should be held up as a, as a way forward, as, an, as in a best practice. We also see in, um, in the global north, OECD working much more now on harmonization. They've taken for um, bacular virus, and now they're looking at doing the same um, around peptides, is to actually create a, a harmonized framework that then other uh, nationalities, other regions can, uh, can use. But again, this, this moment of actually saying, let's take the best practice and let's um, put that into, into a harmonized framework. So what would um, a fit for purpose regulatory framework, um, what does it actually need to deliver? Well, I am gonna use a European example here because I um, think that they've tried actually very, very hard to change their data requirements from chemicals to a more appropriate one around microbials. And a huge amount of effort went into this. And I have to say that actually they've now got an evaluation that is adapted to the biology and ecology of the organism, or indeed, in this case, the, the, the organism. And it allows to come out with a scientifically robust uh, safety evaluation. However, it's fair to say that to be able to use that, one needs to have evaluators who really understand about microbials in this case. That's really important. And if one's got an evaluator sitting in one of the 27 member states who actually is quite important in the evaluation and doesn't understand it, then that can actually slow it all down hugely. So it's part of the story to have the regulation and have it fit for purpose, but actually one then needs to build enough capacity so that all the people evaluating also understand how to use it and, and what the best practice is. So I think these go hand in hand, both the capacity building and creating the data requirements that are fit for purpose. I mentioned timely authorization. It's important for everybody. And creating that certainty, that clarity for industry, that they know where and when we're going to come out of the other side. You can start to make your analysis. You can start to understand um, what you need to do to take it to market. I also wanted to touch on, um, in, in Europe particularly, the difference in the invertebrate biocontrol regulatory challenges. Here, they're not under um, a broad European legislation. EPO have uh, their framework, which 
Rob and Nico very uh, carefully explained. Um, however, when one goes to the individual countries, then often the individual countries might take a slightly different view. And an area I think we've got to be very, very careful on is how we define native. Because what we're seeing is certain political boundaries being used to define native, when actually we should be using biogeographical uh, regions and not necessarily um, political ones. Um, and if we want to move fast and use biological control, particularly around invasive species and emerging pests, then it's really important that we consider this uh, biogeographical uh, boundary and um, very carefully. So turning then to knowledge transfer, it's important for many. Uh, here I've got a, a, a picture. I've um, the work that uh, was done in March um, in bringing forward the um, UNEP project, the farm project, uh, which FAO is uh, very involved in. And I think it's really important, and I, th I bring this out as a best practice, if you like, because it's combining both trying to move away from some of the uh, highly hazardous pesticides, as they're termed, to alternatives, and actually demonstrating both and how to do it. And I think that's really, really an important aspect of uh, moving forward. We mentioned policymakers. Uh, it's important that we bring them to the field as well. Uh, it's difficult if you don't know much about biocontrol and you're trying to rewrite a regulation or to change what you're doing. And so bringing politicians uh, and policymakers to the field, this is in fact a, a farm visit we did with European policymakers and, uh, and inferences just, uh, just last week. And then we talked about farmer sharing farmer knowledge. And I think here we've got something to learn from the organic farming, farming um, groups. And there's a group called the Innovative Farmers. Um, and this is a UK-based group. But they really have created farmer-to-farmer -farmer networks. They don't do anything on their own. They all talk to the guy next door. They all stand in each other's fields. They all have bacon butties in the morning together to try and solve their problems. And this is really what... I think starts to make change. And every time I've spoken to a farmer who's moved to biocontrol, he's actually said what's helped him the most is being able to talk to the farmer next door or to the farmer in the next door village. And creating these farmer to farmer networks is really, really key. There is somewhere that's actually a bit of a powerhouse at the moment for biocontrol. I heard it mentioned once this morning, um, but uh, I think it needs a little bit more of a mention. Um, it really is a global powerhouse, and then Brazil uses biocontrol on 60% of its agricultural area, and it's got 77 million hectares of agriculture. How has it actually made this, this, this change? And just a few key points that have, that have come out. Um, they started with a national program for bio-based agricultural inputs that really focused on research, production, authorization, and that was in around about 2014. And over the course of amending their authorization process, they managed to reduce authorization time from five to one year, five years to one year. They are the fastest growing biocontrol market with a 40% compound annual growth rate. And it's being successfully used in arable crops at equivalent performance to chemical pesticides and at the same cost in a number of cases. I think it's worth looking at how they've done it. What have they done that maybe we can learn from? So one of the things, some of these have come up already today, raising awareness of biocontrol. Most farmers, 90% of farmers, actually know what biocontrol is in Brazil. I think when you go into Europe, it's below 50%. So... There's a lot to be done, and in everybody's country, it's slightly different. Understanding biocontrol, so providing training, providing networking, providing information, and holding people's hands. This is their crop, this is their moment, this is their profit, this is their children's bread and, and butter on the table. So you need to be helped to do it, and we all have a role in that, whether wherever we are in the value chain, whether we're researchers, whether we're manufacturers, whether we're advisors, whether we're in fact buying the end produce, 
All these people have a role to play. And this has allowed Brazil to change. The other thing I would say is you can't force somebody who's uh, growing their own crop to make a change. Anyone who's worked with farmers knows that. You actually need to stand beside and to actually show them and show people again and again why it's working and how it's working. So just to conclude, then biocontrol has a key role. Many people have said it far more eloquently than me today um, in terms of sustainable agriculture, biodiversity and climate mitigation goals. And there are two real key challenges we need to work on. One is the regulatory pathways. They need to be robust safety evaluations in a timely manner so we can actually attract industry investment and get those products to farmers quickly. And knowledge transfer. We need to demonstrate the biocontrol works to give confidence to policymakers to help them develop fit for purpose policies. And of course, to farmers and help them with networks. And as I think it was Lynn um, Lindley who said, seeing is believing. So an important part of what we do. And then I'd come back just as a final point to Gabe Brown, who's, uh, for those of you who know, is an American uh, farmer in North Dakota who changed his whole farm to a far more uh, sustainable practices. He was a livestock farmer, had some uh, arable as well. Uh, but he said that uh, biological life is a force and that once unleashed, it will continue to grow and generate new life. Thank you very much. Thank you.